What is this? I know I'm being a little, a little cheeky. You've clicked on the video, you know what this is. It's a video surveillance camera. If you watched my last video, link up here and down below, you'll know that we went through the whole exercise of what the point of one of these even is. If you haven't watched that video, go back and watch that one first. This is episode two in what I hope to become a masterclass on video surveillance uses and techniques. But before we could even get into uses and techniques, we need to understand what this thing actually is and what it's doing. Because once we can understand that, then we can start having conversations about resolution, image quality, uh, and the individual differences between camera brands to other camera brands. And in this episode, we're going to be answering one simple question, which is, what is a video surveillance camera? So let's dive in. So in my view, the answer to the question of what is a video surveillance camera, it's a device or a sensor that's used to give the user situational awareness. That's a funny term. What is situational awareness? Well, situational awareness is the ability to understand what's going on in the environment that the camera lives in. For me, that could be my house and my front lawn. For a business, it could be your parking lot. It could be your stairwells. It could be your lobby. But ultimately, what a camera's job is, is to give you eyes where you don't have human eyes and, and to give you a tool to protect the assets that you were attempting to protect. Again, if you don't know what an asset is, go back to the last video. Even with situational awareness in mind, a camera should always be deployed with a specific use in mind or a specific application. Is it a parking lot? Is it a stairwell? Is it an ATM machine? What is it that the camera is actually looking at? And what are you attempting to gather from that device? Installing a camera for the sake of installing a camera is, in my view, the most annoying thing that I see or have seen in the 20 years that I've been in this business. Take a look at this picture. This is a picture that I recently took and posted to LinkedIn uh, under the hashtag CCTV fail. This drives me up the wall because there's so many different things going on here. But the, the thing that really gets me is forget about the cabling, forget about the way that they mounted these things. Look at where the cameras are pointed. I can tell as a video surveillance expert, and I would bet that you could tell as a novice or as a physical security professional yourself, that these cameras are actually viewing 50% wall and probably 25% floor and ceiling. So why? Why were these cameras deployed this way? Well, it was probably because they were checking a box. We need a camera. We need a couple of cameras to look at our entry point and our exit point. So let's just deploy these things and we could check a box and move on. Without giving any consideration as to what the proper field of view is or what the actual use and application was for that particular camera. So I'm hoping that you, after watching this video, will be less prone to make those same mistakes. We're going to be reviewing a lot of concepts today. If you have any questions, if you have a specific application that you'd like to throw my way, all of my contact information is down below. Let's set up a session to have a little one-on-one -on -one time so we can walk through your application and I can make recommendations for you that will work for you in your application. So as stated, this is all about the anatomy of a video surveillance camera, and let's start with the most basic type of all, and that's a box camera. The reason why I like to start with this is because all other cameras are basically the same as this, with the exception being form factor. So if we start at the front, uh, something that's missing, obviously here, so that you could see into, uh, into the camera, is the lens. So there is a lens that goes on the front of every camera. That lens takes the light from the environment and shines it onto this little device down here, the imaging device, which is what creates the image. That imager for most IP cameras, most network cameras, is going to be a CMOS imager. If this were the early 2000s, late 90s, these would mostly be CCDs or charge coupled devices. Uh, CMOS sensors have become ubiquitous. And 99 times out of 100, the camera that you're looking at is probably utilizing a CMOS sensor. We'll do a future episode all about CMOS sensor technology. Suffice it to say, for this episode, that's a CMOS sensor. Now, before we get any further into this camera, the other thing we should talk about is illumination or lighting. Usually, and I would encourage you to do this, 
you're going to want to put your camera in a well-lit environment. Now, that's not always possible. So camera manufacturers have come up with some unique ways to give you the extra boost of light that you need. In some cases, it's just as simple as turning the imager into black and white from color during the day. So it's color in the daytime, switches over to black and white at night. Black and white CMOS imagers require less light to produce an image and therefore you can use that camera and that device in an area that doesn't have great lighting at night. So for example, you might only have moonlight and still be able to resolve a usable image. But there are some manufacturers and some camera types that'll give you infrared LEDs that again, only work in black and white, but give you a lot more illumination. Uh, let's say it's completely pitch black and there's no moon out, no starlight, and you still need to be able to resolve an image. Infrared LEDs will give you that capability. And even still, there are manufacturers that provide white light LEDs. Now, white light LEDs are cool because they allow you to see color at night. The range is usually pretty limited, right? The, the visible range of the white lights is pretty short and the ability for the camera to resolve a color image at distance is, is greatly reduced. But if you absolutely need color video at night, that's really the only method other than installing actual lights on your facility. Now, if we look at the side of this camera, you notice this little connector here. This is controlling the iris of the lens. So on, on in the front of this camera would be a lens and a little wire would connect to this connector. The camera would basically send a signal to the lens to say, hey, I need more light, open the iris. Or, hey, 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 I'm getting too much light, close the iris to let the proper amount of light in. It's literally what your eyeballs do every day when, uh, you know, if you look up at the sun, your pupils will, will constrict, your irises will constrict to uh, let less light in. The auto iris is doing literally the exact same thing. You would say, well, if there's auto iris, is there some other manual iris? Yes, there is manual iris, uh, manual iris lenses. We very rarely see those these days. They were very popular in the analog days. For now, most cameras that you're going to use are going to be some sort of auto iris technology. So now that we've gotten through the optics and the sensor, now we go one layer underneath, and that's the DSP or the digital signal processor. The processor inside the camera is what's giving you all the advanced capabilities and features beyond just resolving an image and giving you that image. What about video analytics, motion detection, automatic gain control, automatic white balance, wide dynamic range? Uh, we'll cover each one of these topics in, in a future video, but the DSP is the thing that is doing all of that sort of image processing. If you think about your camera phone, for example, the camera phone that you had in the early 2000s and the camera phone that you have today are two completely different technologies. Really, I mean, you're talking about leaps and bounds difference, but ultimately what has made those technologies better is the signal processing that the manufacturers are using inside of the phone, right? The cameras themselves, the imagers themselves, the lensing uh, the lenses themselves have all ostensibly stayed the same, same type of technology. They're still using CMOS sensors, they're still using glass lenses, but the DSP has gotten better and better and better and better. And that advancement in technology at the DSP level is what's able to give you really good image rendering at night, let's say on your phone. So the DSP in any camera is extremely important. And you'll see in the more expensive cameras, those usually have the better DSPs and will give you more features and better performance, particularly at night. As we move to the rear of the camera, this is where some of the, uh, some of the more fun stuff kicks into play. So first and foremost, you've got your ethernet port. That ethernet port is used to transport the data that's being collected on the camera over your network to whatever recording device you happen to be using. It can also be used for power. So there's a technology called Power Over Ethernet or PoE. We'll do a whole episode on, on PoE and, and the different standards and when you would use them in video surveillance. Suffice it to say, you can actually power this camera from one Cat5 or Cat6 cable going directly into this port. And you say, Phil, what if I don't have PoE and I only have network uh, a network cable with no power on it? Well, that's where these connectors come into play. 
On lesser expensive cameras, you will not have this option. On the more expensive cameras, the professional grade video surveillance cameras, you will usually have a 24 volt AC or 12 volt DC input, sometimes both, uh, to allow you to have power to the camera, even if you don't have PoE. So you might be saying, well, if I have PoE, then why do I need separate power? You're not always gonna have PoE. Uh, we're installing this in the middle of a field, let's say, and I'm uh, having to tap power off of a light pole. The likelihood that I'm gonna have a switch that has power over ethernet built into it, you know, it's possible, but it's not likely. What is likely is I have 120 volts or 220, 240 volts that I can step down to 24 volts AC and then use the ethernet port to send my signal out wirelessly um, to, you know, to some place that's got my video management software on it. These power options are normally used by professionals and why you see these power options available on pro grade cameras as opposed to some of the prosumer or consumer grade cameras, which are really usually only going to be uh, PoE and that's it. Again, another feature on professional grade cameras that you're not going to see on the, at the prosumer level or the consumer level is this video output option, this composite video output option. So here, this is just a little uh, jumper cable that would come out into a BNC connector. What this is used for is to send a composite video signal or just like a regular video signal to a monitor. So one of the challenges with IP cameras is if I want to display the video, I need to have a computer to do that. The issue there is if I want to maybe have a public view monitor, a, a monitor that, you know, you, you've seen them when you walk into a convenience store, there's a big display up and it's got your face on it and it says, smile, you're on camera as, as a deterrent to get people to not steal from that store. The way that they're able to get the video from the camera system to that monitor is over a composite connection. Otherwise, that monitor would either need to be plugged into their video management software, which can be expensive, or that monitor has to have a computer attached to it, which again can be expensive. This is a really low cost way of getting video from your network camera to a composite video device. The disadvantage there is that you're not getting the full resolution, right? It's, it's a low resolution stream, but usually that's more. Next, you've got this port here. These are the alarm inputs and outputs. So theoretically, this particular camera has an alarm in and an alarm out. What that does is it gives you the ability to make contact closures at the camera level. Why? Well, for my alarm input, let's say I have a door and I have a door contact on that door. So every time the door opens, um, that door contact closure breaks and I can send that signal into my camera and tell my camera to start recording. That's very powerful, right? So maybe it's a motion detector, maybe it's some other sensor device that I'm sending the input into the camera to have the camera do something, usually recording video or taking a snapshot on the onboard SD card, which we'll get into in a second, uh, or maybe playing a, a message via the audio output jack of, of the particular camera, right? So, hey, if motion is detected during the schedule, play this message. And that motion detector can be wired directly to the camera. The camera usually also has some other sort of uh, detection systems in it. So that's the most rudimentary of these being motion detection. So if the camera senses motion, it can send a signal out to maybe an alarm system, maybe to a video management system, or to some other system to alert. You know, it could just be a guard at a desk and a light turns on. Well, that light turning on was the result of the camera sensing motion and closing the contact at the input output level of the camera itself. There are tons more use cases for that. If you could think of any yourself, if you've used this particular feature, leave me a comment down below and let me know how you deployed it. I mentioned SD card slot. So this camera also has a micro SD card slot. So it gives you the ability to record video at the edge. And you say, Phil, why would I want to do that? SD cards are small and unreliable. True and true. However, if you lose network connectivity for any reason and the camera is recording at the edge, most video management systems will be able to um, retrieve that video from the SD card, 
when the network comes back up. Or worst case scenario, you don't have a video management system and you don't have that video trickling feature, you still have video, it's on the camera itself. So, so long as you have power, right? So if we lose network connectivity and we're on PoE, chances are you've lost the camera itself, right? Your switch is dead, there's no power, the camera's offline. However, if you have a professional grade camera with a 24 volt AC input, even if my network connection dies and my camera still has power and I have an SD card in there, I'm still recording video. And finally, audio. Not every camera is going to have audio in and audio out. That tends to be a feature of the more expensive cameras. But, you know, think about your particular use case and how you're going to use your, your camera. Is an audio output worth it? Do you want to be able to play messages out at the edge without having to deploy another smart device, another IoT device? Well, then using that audio output could be a benefit to you. The audio in basically allows you to have a microphone out at, uh, at, at your edge where the camera is. Now, obviously check your, your laws in your local jurisdictions to make sure that that's even legal. But if it is, and you've got your, your signage posted, the ability to hear what the camera is seeing can be a huge benefit. And if you have an in and an out, now you have the ability to have two-way communication wherever the camera is. And of course, because these are IP devices, you could literally have two-way communication with this camera, even if it's on the other side of the world. So that covers the majority of the actual physical anatomy of a video surveillance camera. Let's talk about form factors, because there's a lot of them. And let's start with the box camera. Box cameras, while not used as much anymore, are probably still the most versatile offering any manufacturer is going to offer. Why? Well, for starters, you can change the lens. The lens is interchangeable. That's not usually true for a bullet or a dome camera or a PTZ camera. So if you want a really, really, really long range lens or a macro lens or some super wide angle lens, chances are your best bet is to actually have a, a box camera and be able to choose a third party lens that fits your specific application. The other advantage of these is that you get to choose the housing that they go into. 99 times out of 100, a bullet or a dome camera is going to be just fine depending on your environment. But there are environments like um, really corrosive environments where you need a specialized stainless steel housing, for example, or um, an explosion proof environment where you're dealing with hazardous chemicals that are prone to uh, ignition sources. This may be your only option and sticking it into an ex explosion proof housing. So the box camera, although not used as much today, is actually quite versatile and may be your only option given your specific use case. The next one is a bullet camera. Now, bullet cameras get their name because uh, back in the late 90s and early 2000s, not to date myself, but analog cameras tended to be much smaller than IP cameras. And a bullet camera was literally about the size of a, of a bullet, about the, a, a shotgun shell size. This, on the other hand, is also referred to as a bullet camera. But I think it, it's more to do with the, uh, the overall shape of the thing uh, as opposed to the size of it. Because again, bullet cameras are, are quite large these days. What's nice about these is that they're usually completely self-contained. They're usually uh, weatherproof. Again, you know, check your specifications, but 99 times out of 100, a bullet camera is going to be waterproof. It's going to be self-contained. It's going to come with its own lens. A lot of times it's going to come with IR illuminators, which this one has as well. So at nighttime, I'll be able to resolve an image in black and white using the IR LEDs in this, in this camera. I've got a number of inputs and outputs as well. This is a professional grade uh, camera from Hanwha. Um, it's got a network, uh, a PoE jack, it's got my power options, it's got an SD card slot, it's got a, an external I.O. module. So this is a fully featured camera in a self-contained housing. So those are the advantages. The disadvantage to a bullet camera, in my view, is you can always tell where it's pointed, right? So if I, if I saw a bullet camera and it was pointed this way and I wanted to get around it, I, I could see exactly where I need to go in order to subvert the view of the camera. The other issue with this is as much as camera manufacturers try, um, and Hanwha is no, no different in this case, I mean, this thing is rugged, 
it's still vulnerable to uh, vandalism, right? If I took a sledgehammer or a baseball bat and really started a whale on this thing, I could potentially knock it out of place. Where would you use one of these? Well, if I really wanted people to know where my camera's pointed, and believe it or not, there are instances in which that is the case. You know, if you think about like a, like a, a, a dump, uh, where you have folks that might consider illegally dumping their garbage onto your into your property. Maybe you want them to see <laughs> that they will be on camera. And so you'd have this camera out there pointed directly at your assets. The other advantage to a bullet camera specific for IR illumination is it tends to be less susceptible to IR glow. Uh, I'll throw an, an image up on the screen uh, of some examples, but what you'll see sometimes in some dome cameras with infrared illumination is the shape of the dome itself lends to having the IR light reflected back into the lens. So you get this halo effect, which is really annoying, especially when you're trying to see somebody right attacking attacking your assets. Whereas a dome, uh, a bullet camera, excuse me, uh, because the of the way that the glass is shaped the LEDs can be in its own sort of um, module within the housing, which tends to give you less uh, glare when the LEDs are turned on. So that's something really important to, to factor in. Uh, again, you'll know where the camera's pointing. It's less susceptible to the LED uh, glare, but it is prone to, uh, to being knocked out of place. Now that brings us to dome cameras. And you see I have a, a couple of dome cameras here. There's so many different versions uh, of dome cameras. There's turret style. There's like hybrid bullet domes uh, that, that are pretty popular these days. Uh, these are, uh, again, two popular form factors. We'll start with this little teeny tiny one. This is a Sony a DH-110 long discontinued uh, holdover from my days at Sony. Uh, but this was an indoor vandal resistant dome camera. This is by far the greatest advantage to a dome camera is this bubble shape allows the manufacturers to build these polycarbonate domes to withstand some pretty substantial beatings. If you check the spec sheets for these cameras, you'll usually see a vandal resistance rating. Um, it's an IK rating and that IK rating goes from one all the way up. Uh, but typically in the physical security space, you'll see IK9, between IK6 and IK10, IK9 being probably one of the most popular, an IK10 vandal resistance rating is actually quite high, and this thing could probably take a beating from a sledgehammer all day long and uh, and not be too worse for wear. The same is true for this sort of dome camera. Again, polycarbonate bubble can take a licking and keep on ticking. Uh, this again being a pro professional grade camera gives me multi multitudes of outputs uh, out of the back of this thing. The advantage to a dome camera, no matter the form factor, is A, usually it's vandal resistance, and B, the fact that it's all self-contained, right? It's the lens, it's the housing, everything's done. The disadvantage being because of the size, you usually can't fit a really big lens in here unless you go with a much larger dome camera. Uh, so typically your lens ranges are between you know, 2.8 to 12 millimeters, I would say is probably the max. Are there dome cameras that have maybe a five millimeter to 50 millimeter lens and, and larger? Sure, uh, but those are few and further between and probably a lot more expensive. The smaller the dome camera, uh, comparatively speaking, the less likelihood you are to have a verifocal or a, a an adjustable lens in here. So case in point in this particular camera, this was a wide angle lens. I believe it was 3.6 millimeters. And the intended use for this camera was like to monitor stairwells or really uh, tight and confined spaces. Because of its size and limited capability, it was perfect for that particular use case because it wasn't super expensive at the time. Now, a subset of dome cameras are these fisheye cameras and multi-sensor cameras. So here in my hand, I have an old Aerocont Vision multi-sensor camera. Um, I'll take a close-up picture and, and put it up on the screen. But as you can see here, there are four individual lenses inside of this one camera. Now, each one of these lenses 
is a fixed lens. There's no variability to it. There's no adjustment to it. But the advantage of this camera is if I stick it up on a wall, I have full 180 degree coverage of that entire area versus a traditional dome camera, even with a wide angle lens. If I wanted that level of visibility, I'd have to put in multiple dome cameras or bullet cameras or box cameras. The multi-sensor allows me to cover a much larger area from one sensor position. The disadvantage obviously being the lack of flexibility on the camera itself. Again, the lens sizes tend to be fixed. The lens positions tend to be fixed. There's actually a couple of cameras from Hanwha and Axis that have uh, this uh, multi-imager approach that allow you to actually pick your lenses ahead of time and have some, some level of variability in terms of the placement of the, of the camera module. Um, those would probably be the only multi-sensor cameras that I would ever recommend. These were great for the time. This is, this is a pretty old camera, maybe five or six years ago. This was, um, this was like the de facto standard for multi-sensor cameras. Now, again, the, the modules from Axis, Hanwha, or any multi-sensor camera that allows you to pick your lenses, those are the ones that you want to go with. And then finally, I don't, I don't have one here, so I'll throw some pictures up on the screen, but there are, instead of a multi-sensor 360-degree camera, there are single sensor, or what we call fisheye dome cameras. So these cameras allow you to have this really wide 360 degree sort of warped view that allow you to have situational awareness over a very large area from one sensor placement. And then through camera software allows you to de-warp the image to make it look more like a traditional video surveillance camera. The advantage of these cameras when deployed properly is it allows you to cover an area from one sensor position with adequate coverage. Where would I install these? I would only ever install a multi-sensor camera in an area that has relatively low ceilings, right? No more than 10 or 12 feet. And maybe I'm looking at a hallway intersection. So it's a four-way intersection in a hallway. I can put this one camera right in the middle and capture pretty fine detail all the way around all four intersections. Any more than that, you're pushing the camera beyond its design capabilities. In other words, the stuff that you're gonna capture at the edges, or if you mount it much higher, 15, 20 feet up, you're going to see a whole lot of nothing. Will you see people moving around? Yeah, but it's the equivalent of looking at people from an airplane window not really super usable. You don't see them used very much anymore. Uh, I think people have sort of caught on to the, the distinct limitations of a fisheye camera. But again, when deployed correctly, it could be a tool in your arsenal. And finally, rounding up the camera lineup here is pan, tilt, and zoom cameras. PTZ, or my friends across the pond would say PTZ. A pan, tilt, and zoom camera allows you to control where the camera's pointed and what it's looking at. So I can pan it, I can tilt it, and I can zoom in to a particular subject. This camera is a, this camera type is extremely useful when you have human operators behind a console watching your surveillance video. It is terrible in every other circumstance. What do I mean by that? So I love pan, tilt, and zoom cameras. As someone who sells LiDAR sensors for my day job, I can tell you that uh, the combination of a LiDAR sensor with a pan, tilt, and zoom camera will allow me to send coordinates of objects directly to the PTZ with no human involvement. However, in 90% of the use cases out there where LiDAR sensors are either way too expensive or not particularly practical, a pan, tilt, and zoom camera, unless it has a human behind it, is never gonna be pointed where you want it to be pointed and therefore should be used judiciously. Again, huge benefit to a pan, tilt, and zoom because you can follow someone live and be able to see exactly what it is that they're doing in very fine detail, but if you're not watching it live and the thing is on a, a preset tour or is just pointed into its home position, chances are it's not gonna be looking at what you wanted it to be looking at when the thing actually happened. So that was quite the overview. And at the outset, 
we said, you know, what do we want to get out of this video? We wanted to understand what a video surveillance camera actually is, how it works, and what the different form factors are, with the understanding that these cameras are typically going to be used for situational awareness purposes. I want to be able to see what's going on in my facility, and I'm going to choose the proper camera type for that application. Remember, individual cameras should be chosen based on your specific use case. In a future video, we'll go through a specification sheet because chances are you're not gonna be able to see these cameras in your hands all the time, right? Video surveillance cameras are not like, you know, you, can, you can't go to Best Buy and look at every single camera like you would look at every single TV that you wanna buy. Most of these purchases are gonna happen sight unseen and therefore you're gonna rely on a manufacturer's specification sheet to tell you more about the camera. In a future episode, we'll dive deep into camera manufacturer specs so that way you understand what it is that you're actually getting yourself into. Until then, I hope this episode was useful to you. If you like this episode, give me a thumbs up and make sure you hit that subscribe button. If you have questions, if you'd like to learn more, if you have a specific application that you would like to speak to somebody about, all of my contact information is down below. My name's Phil Coppola. I'm a board certified physical security professional with over 20 years of experience in the security industry. I hope you like this video and we'll see you on the next one.